This is the Cheers Podcast. Good day, everyone. I'm your host, Patrick Everett. Today on the Cheers Podcast, I wanted to share with you my takeaway from the Porter Brownsville Navigation District Candidate Forum. The forum was hosted by Citizens Against Voter Abuse on April 17, 2018, at the South Modes Public Library in Brownsville, Texas. This recent candidate forum allowed candidates for commissioner to take questions from the public. Besides my thoughts on the candidate forum, I invited Patrick Anderson, one of the candidates and a teacher from Los Fresnos, to discuss the recent Brownsville Navigation District election, LNG, and the May 22, 2018 Democratic primary runoff election that is underway between Alex Dominguez and Rene Oliveira. Just to note, this episode was recorded after the port elections and a little bit before the primary uh, runoff. So with that, let's get started. After reading statements made by the poor candidates in the media, and hearing from three of them during the recent forum, I think it's important to reflect on their comments and their positions on protecting the environment and improving the economy. The following statements uh, made by the candidates are from the Brownsville Herald article called Five Candidates Running for Two Port Positions. Patrick Anderson is opposed to the development of LNG facilities at the port. Uh, It stands based on what he said is keeping with international trends towards renewable energy and a transition away from investments in fossil fuel. The port right now isn't looking to go that route. To provide that sort of industry, Anderson said, I think it's bad economically as other companies transition off fossil fuels. The port's energy portfolio is a big mistake. So we know by now that Patrick Anderson lost the election to Steve Guetta. Uh, I will get into the details later in the episode with Mr. Anderson. Uh, That said, my thoughts on Mr. Anderson is that he's the only one speaking out and running for public office to pressure a faster transition away from fossil fuels and towards, this, uh, towards renewable energy. Uh, this is a leader that doesn't fall for the same myopic narrative of economic development that the other candidates express. Take a listen to what the other candidates said about protecting the environment. If they are cleared and there's no environmental impact, then we need to work closely with them. We need to uh, produce jobs here. Not just jobs, but sustainable jobs, says Steve Guetta who is an entrepreneur that ran for place two in 2014. Keep note that phrase, sustainable jobs. Geta said he, uh, he would use his many business contacts here and abroad to make that happen. That sounds like the same routine that already exists at the port. Cesar Lopez said the port also lacks a modern mission statement, a workable, feasible, and strategic development plan to guide development during the next 15 or 20 years. That's something we, uh, we implemented in Brownsville Independent School District, with short-term goals and benchmarks, he said. I think it is needed to ter- in terms of job creation, Lopez said. At the same time, we have, hold these fo- we have to hold these folks accountable and make sure they respect the environment. I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. This is a beautiful bay that we have, and we need to take care of it. At the candidate forum, Patrick Anderson said the same proposal, albeit he mentioned a 50-year strategic plan when asked a question about improving the port. And when it came, uh, comes to respecting the environment, at the forum, Lopez mentioned that he would just refer all environmental complaints and incidents, incidents to the state and environmental jurisdictions. That's just normal protocol, not fresh ideas for keeping them accountable or respecting the environment. What did the other political slate, like Javier Vera and John Wood, say about the environment? John Vera said he, he supports LNG development as long as the companies involved are good stewards of the land. If Veda is going to keep his answer framed as a vague good intention, then I'm going to, I can evaluate the entire supply chain of the LNG development process to determine if they're actually good stewards of the land. A quick Google search later, the answer is no. They are not good stewards of the land. John Wood says he favors LNG development, which he thinks would be a good opportunity for the entire area, though the environment is important too. We're all concerned about the environment, every one of us, he said. When a company comes to talk to the poor about the possibility of locating here, that's one of the first things we talk about. I see Mr. Woods and all the other candidates' good intention with respecting the environment, but their words mean nothing when their actions would do the opposite. 
these LNG plants and the entire fossil fuel uh, supply chain from financing, business, extraction, transmission, export, import, and the end product impact the environment. But you don't see that. You see, you see jobs and, and not the real harm that these old forms of fossil fuel energy dependence are causing to our global biosphere. The impacts can be felt and have been scientifically documented. We just need to incorporate that information to our decision-making process for a better informed regional strategic development plan. That statement, the statements that Steve Guetta, Cesar Lopez, Javier Vera, and John Wood are considerate for lacking agency to prevent further social and environmental harm that is substan substantially changing the world's ecology. As Pope Francis has said about uh, appropriating the language of protecting nature for financial gain, in this context, talk of sustainable growth usually becomes a way of distracting attention and offering excuses absorbs the language and values of ecology into the categories of finance and technocracy. And the social and environmental responsibility of businesses often gets reduced to a series of marketing and image enhancing measures. Let's expand this example of absorbing the language and values of ecology into finance and technocracy and shift social and environmental issues towards public relations, technocratic re regulators, and compliance teams that have been captured by the fossil fuel industry long ago. We live in Texas, so we are dominated by the fossil fuel industry. However, we have people saying that we should continue to depend on the fossil fuel industry for sustainable jobs. Th this narrative goes like this. If we're already shipping petroleum in and out of the port and the pipelines are in the ground throughout the RGB, why are these environmentalists so concerned about the environment now? It is what it is. They just want us with no jobs and in poverty. So if people don't know, there's already existing pipelines throughout the valley underground and we have petroleum moving in and out of the rgb the fact uh, that fact is somehow a kind of argument for justifying continued support for the fossil fuel industry in our regional economic economic development i posed this question to mr anderson which you get to hear his response but to my understanding just because we installed pipelines in the past doesn't mean we should continue to expand and install more if we truly want to take care of the environment specifically the global climate and our wetlands the existing pipelines are already old, and thus the, their risk of spills and releases are also increasing each day that passes. These pipelines leak like the ones in the D Dakotas that impacted the drinking waters of the Native Americans recently. The Native Americans continue to oppose the pipelines, their impacts to the environment, and depending on the severity of the release, their impacts to public health as well. The Port of Bronzo is currently shipping petroleum products in and out of the port. So why oppose fossil fuels now if petroleum is dirtier than liquid natural gas? This general nat narrative and sentiment is made by the majority of the port commissioners, except for Mr. Anderson, which shows their ignorance with the entire supply chain of the oil and gas industry. It shows their lack of awareness about the wars perpetrated on these same natural resources. They see geopolitics as separate from local decisions, or maybe they do see geopolitics affected by local decisions but choose to maintain the fossil fuel status quo. This is disturbing for many reasons. They see that the non-unionized jobs are a higher priority over the preservation of life for vulnerable communities throughout the, the RGB and around the world that are connected to the oil and gas supply chain and their geopolitical decisions. We're just one node of a large system that needs accountability, not just from state and federal environmental standards, but from local democratic institutions like the Navigation District. And I don't mean deferring or referring complaints to the state or federal environmental agencies. The narrative also, lack, uh, also reveals their lack of interest in diligently trans, uh, transitioning to renewable and clean sources of energy production in the local level. The claim that the politics in the federal and state government will pressure local leaders to compromise their environmental stewardship, if they have any, for non-unionized jobs just because of the oil and gas industry's hegemony in Texas is exemplary of the threats and dangers to our democracy. This also reveres their lack of agency to lead us to a renewable and democratic future. They see that it is out of their authorized powers to stop these projects as forces above them in the federal and state government will get what they want no matter if the poor commissioners protest or yell, yell their lungs out. This is the example of the lack of democracy in our country. We need more democratic practices so ordinary folks could determine their future and not, and not to be determined by forces above us in the social and political hierarchy. To answer the rhetorical question in the statement, the purpose to oppose fossil fuels now and not the existing local pipelines and petroleum shipments is about strategy. 
it is more effective to seize unsustainable projects from starting than spending personnel and resources on established entities. To correct a complex problem like this, you start by seizing new operations that are causing the issue in the first place, and at the same time create strategies to transition to ecological sustainable projects. It is a process of corrective action that is required at this time. Doing that for the long term will address the current fossil fuel consumption by reducing its dominance and near monopoly power in the, in the energy industry. In the big picture, is, it is strategy for a diversified portfolio so the Port of Brownsville moves towards an ecological conscience society and eliminates our dependence on fossil fuels that are causing innocent lives to be lost in the Middle East and breeding hatred and violence towards our federal government and even our people. It leads us away from our dependence on injecting frack wastewater into the ground, impacting groundwater in the United States. It leads us away from the man-made earthquakes that impact public safety in the United States. It leads us away from potential sinkholes that impact public safety and property in the United States. It leads us away from the claim that Texas will be an oil and gas state perpetually into the future. Texas are the leaders in wind energy for the country. We could also be uh, leaders in renewable energy and manufacturing for the world. That leads me to this May 22nd, 2018 Democratic primary runoff election between Alex Dominguez and René Oliveira. It looks like Oliveira is capitalizing on Dominguez's vote on the 373 million tax abatement towards Rio Grande LNG and his disagreement with the Friends of the West Royal Trail Community Group. Let's start with the tax abatement vote. A corporate welfare deal with me. According to the Brownsville Herald, under the terms of the Cameron County and Rio Grande LNG agreement, county officials say they will have been guaranteed a minimum of 35% of construction and permanent jobs for local residents. If this does not happen, the company will be penalized with payment, payments for missing the target on their benchmark. My initial thoughts when the news broke were, how much is the penalty? Would there be an extra penalty for defaulting on its agreement? How are violations of the agreement enforced and inspected? Are they self-reporting their information with no verification process? If the tax abatement was not provided to the company, would the company stay or look for another port that is deeper? Is the $373 million deal truly necessary to bring this company here as the global market is already doing that? Would this deal be another bluff to the community just like Anova, who demonstrated they did not need their handout after all? I and others that oppose the LNG companies disagree with the tax abatement vote that Alex made, but it looks like Rene knows that and needs these two coalitions that have dealt with Alex and found roadblocks with him regarding their efforts. Renata supports the LNG companies before and after they get their permits and specifically goes after Alex for his timing of support by stating if the company has already decided to locate at the Port of Bronzo and health and safety issues have not been determined, why did he vote to give away $373 million in taxpayer dollars? That echoes one of my questions. Why is the tax abatement truly necessary if they are already decided to locate here due to global market demands? I think Rene knows the answer to his question as he has been given guarantees and knows the odds that the permit would not be pulled altogether. So he pretends to condition his support as if all the health and safety standards may not adequately be addressed by state and federal governments. They will, they will meet health and safety standards, if not now, over time, and the permit will be issued especially with this type of local politics. It is support nevertheless from both men. I suspect that Alex has been given similar guarantees and knows the, the same odds. Rene appears to be splitting hairs on issues that two community coalitions are focused on right now. Their support appears to be significant this election cycle, and I want listeners to know that these community coalitions have pressured these men to talk about their causes and concerns in an election. These types of institutional contests have pressured local leaders for great community projects, and, want, and I want to put a spotlight on that power. An example is County Judge Eddie Trevino's tax abatement vote where he demonstrated support for the Friends of the West Rail Trail Community Coalition, where Alex and the other county commissioners did not. According to the Friends of the West Rail Trail Facebook page, it appears that they had had a good meeting with Representative Oliveira on May 17, 2018, where he heard their concerns and committed his influence in the state level to support their cause. Uh, according to them, we spoke about the work the city of Brownsville has done to move the trail project forward, including securing funds for environmental assessment and about the needs to happen to keep it going. Representative Oliveira committed to, a, a, uh, to mediate with TxDOT and other key players to move the project along. Moreover, several people expressed concerns about the county commissioner, Dominguez. They elected four years ago to represent them. 
who has not been supportive of what the community has been asking for. I think we need more of this emergency community power. These local groups are building the necessary tools, resources, and practices for others to learn, debate, and develop together as a better democracy. I hope my opinions help someone out there interested in these decisions that have consequences for our future community that we're creating together. I ask for you to go out with others and vote this May 22nd, 2018. Up next, after this short break, I will be speaking with Patrick Anderson. Mr. Anderson is a Los Fresnos teacher who recently ran for Port Commissioner. I wanted to learn from his experience running for public office and his thoughts on LNG in the Democratic primary runoff election between Alex Dominguez and Rene Oliveira. As a disclaimer, even though I closed the blinds, one of my dogs, Bunny, was still able to sense people walking outside and commenced to bark for about a minute during the discussion. Bear with me during that time as I have no idea how to edit that out. If someone listening knows of someone that can edit out the parts, let me know. Other than that, stay tuned. That song is called Adventures by Himichu, available on Spotify. Hi, my name is Patrick Everett from the Cheers Podcast. I'm here talking with Patrick Anderson to discuss the recent Brownsville Navigation District elections, the LNG export facilities, and the Democratic primary runoff election that's underway between Alex Dominguez and Rene Oliveira. Patrick Anderson recently ran for Port Commissioner and ended up with about 990 votes, about 16.4%, losing the election to Steve Guetta, who obtained 2,710 votes, about 44.9%. I invited Patrick on the show to learn more about his experience running for public office and also to pick his brain about the LNG and the runoff. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I usually start uh, with the cheers and the cling with glasses together, but because I'm talking to you over the phone, I don't have that option right now. Um, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what made you decide to run for public office? Well, um, I'm a teacher at Los Angeles High School, and uh, the reason I ran for the Port Commission is um, uh, there's many reasons. Um, we're seeing a lot of local impacts more and more on the public uh, from the Port of Brownsville. Um, so that was one of the biggest reasons. And that impact ranges from environmental to um, to infrastructure running through our cities, our communities, to even tax dollars being uh, given or being given away to the industries coming in at the port. Um, so I guess why I'm running on a large scale, on a macro scale, uh, I think the port really needs to start looking at impacts uh, and and what their role is and their contribution to climate change and, and mitigating that impact. Uh, we see uh, ports uh, across the world um, and even here in the United States uh, with goals to um, operate carbon neutral. Um, and some of the, the ports out in California are uh, being leaders with that initiative. Um, and they're, they realize they, their impact with and, and trying to manage their role with, with climate change. And they see that, that the international community is moving towards um, energies that are off, getting off fossil fuels. And it's a challenge because Texas is kind of in an energy bubble where oil and gas dominates everything. And the Port of Brownsville is looking at the easiest way to build up the Port of Brownsville is obviously oil and gas. But that's a consequence to um, that uh, to, to to the environment and to communities. Um, kind of on a local scale, um, we're seeing pipelines being put in and run through our communities, including with Fresnos. Um, but it's without it's, it's overlooking kind of that public safety in, uh, element where we have the pipeline that was just recently put in, running just yards away from neighborhoods and uh, between two schools. 
and uh, that those two schools, many, many neighborhoods and many houses are within the blast zone of the pipeline. And we have to keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily have to be a uh, uh, deterioration of the pipeline for the pipeline to fail. Many of these pipelines happen because of construction accidents and things of that nature. Oh, well, that leads up to the, my next uh, topic. Well, my next uh, questions will be, well, like we live in Texas, so yeah, like you said, it's dominated by the fossil fuel industry. However, um, we have people saying that we should continue to de uh, depend on the fossil fuel industry for sustainable jobs. Uh, this narrative goes like this: uh, we already we're already shipping petroleum in and out of the port, and the pipelines are in the ground throughout the RGV. Uh, why are these environmentalists so concerned about the environment now? Uh, it is what it is. They just want us to have no jobs and, and be in poverty. What's your thoughts on that? I think first we have to uh, look at that argument. Um, and my initial reaction is that, uh, well, it's already, it's, people say, well, the port is already polluted, so why not just keep moving forward? I think that's kind of uh, a really um, irresponsible argument, but I also think that argument doesn't hold water. It's kind of like saying, well, um, if we look at Oklahoma, for example, uh, where there's been lots of fracking, and now we're seeing uh, a lot of the homes. I've met uh, uh, quite a few people in Oklahoma whose homes have now foundation problems because of the, the, the seismic activity. And so, like, well, my home is already cracked, so I'm not going to do anything about it. Now, it's, the problem just keeps on getting worse. It's, it's ignoring the problem. So um, to my end, that doesn't hold much water. But I also think also... Uh, we have to be looking at the future where if we're ramping up this oil and gas industry, um, it's, it's, we're going to be end up, we're going to end up like a, a, a ghost town eventually. Um, I, this, this industry only has, uh, uh, a certain lifetime. Uh, and I think, um, you know, there's that argument, but I also think there's nothing wrong with diversifying the, the, the industries at the port. If we're looking at a port that only has oil and gas as their energy sector, um, I think that's a weak, that's, that's a very weak, um, um, portfolio for a port, um, especially for a port that's only doing international, or well, I should say, that's doing 95% of their international business just right across the border. And I think expanding that energy market would certainly help the port expand its, its exports, uh, internationally. Okay. Well, what about that phrase that they keep repeating, uh, sustainable jobs? Like, I feel like it has like double meaning for us, uh, people who are kind of for the environmental movement or for uh, right. clean energy, but they're starting to like co-opt the language of, from the Greens and start saying like, oh, sustainable jobs or sustainable economic development. Uh, what's your right. thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think that, that also doesn't hold, hold water. If you look at the historics of the oil and gas industry, it's very up and down. So. Um, let's, let's take a look at 2016, just real recently. Um, there is tens of thousands of oil and gas jobs that were laid off. We're talking about a market that's very up and down. So when you talk about jobs, then that's not stable. So, um, so 72,000 jobs, I believe it was, uh, there were, there were laid off in 2016. Sorry, in 2016, what? there is 1 million jobs employed in the renewable and alternative fuel industries. So, it's, it's very stark different. There's actually more people employed in the renewable and alternative fuel industry rather than the oil and gas industry. Um, if, we're, if, if we're looking at adding more jobs to the Texas economy and to the Port of Brownsville, uh, that's certainly in a sector that's being ignored, and we could actually add more jobs and more stable jobs in that other sector. So in terms of jobs, you know, we want to... Uh, I, I don't think the, the argument holds water with trying to stick to one industry in one sector of the economy, uh, when we can expand and add more jobs. Now, if you look at jobs like like a solar manufacturing facility compared to an LNG facility, um, let's take a look at the Mission Solar in San Antonio. They have, they'll have 1,045 jobs employed at the facility by 2019, and their factory is only 24,000 square feet. Now, compare that to an LNG facility. That is, uh, let's take a look at Rio Grande LNG. That's 1,000 acres. Uh, much, much, much larger than the solar panel facility, and they'll only employ about 200 jobs. So when you talk about jobs, particularly at the port, for land space, um, fossil fuel really does not offer, they don't have the bank for the buck compared to 
solar panel manufacturing and, and manufacturing in general. So I saw on your Facebook page that you reluctantly told your followers followers to vote for Rene Oliveira. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you explain why you endorsed uh, Rene Oliveira? Well, it's it's um, I hate to call it an endorsement, <laughs> but uh, I, this is true. Um, let me start with let me start with Alex Dominguez. Uh, uh, myself and, and a few others met with Alex Dominguez early on about the tax statements, and we had put together a, a fairly large and in-depth document um, outlining the the tax dollars that would go to support the LNG Rio Grande LNG and 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 the other LNG facilities, and and showing that you know we're going to need those tax dollars uh, because we're, the the county is going to be paying out. Uh, for example, uh, for things like um, public services, like in, uh, emergency services, police and security, uh, and and ambulances, um, things like repairing infrastructure. Um, just recently, we saw uh, damage to Highway 100 in those residents because of the pipeline. That's coming out of tax dot. It's not coming out of the county, but it's still tax dollar money paying for that infrastructure. So we're seeing these big give outs to the oil and gas industry at the cost of public tax dollars. Um, so, anywho, so so Alex Dominguez uh, very much said at the end of the meeting, you know, they're getting the tax abatement, um, and this is the way things are done. And we had met with the other commissioners before, and he was the last one. And aside from Eddie Trevino, the other commissioners really didn't have much info, and and um, they they very much thanked us for the information that we gave them. So I feel fairly confident, although you know, have no facts this, but feel very confident that Dominguez lobbied the other commissioners uh, to vote for this tax abatement and and to really give away the only benefit that these LNG uh, companies would provide to our community, and that's the, that's the tax dollars. And and so they gave away they gave a hundred percent tax abatement to Rio Grande LNG, uh, but they will pay payments in lieu of taxes that only equate to twenty three percent of what they would pay in taxes. So I think uh, that kind of leadership is. Very much, very irresponsible uh, to 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 the to the public, um, but also on other issues like the West Rail Trail, Dominguez uh, is still pushing for the road, even though the the, the public overwhelmingly um, want a hike and bike trail for the full length of of where that rail line would be. So Dominguez has time and time again um, has through leadership um, has is pushing things through in his own interest with a deaf ear to, to what the public wants. And and my feeling and many other uh, people in the community feel that you know, he's even more of a threat in office than Oliveira because he'll just uh, uh, rule and, and legislate to his own agenda without without a ear to the public. Um, so uh, how, how sure are you about Rene's retirement? He helped with the passage of the HB40, and he has the oil and yeah. gas industry financial yeah. backing. Uh, how do we know that his only critique of Alex, which is his vote for the tax abatement, is not like a temporary political strategy to obtain your 990 votes? Right. Well, uh, I think uh, it definitely is a, a, a temporary strategy. Um, I, he, he's been meeting with other community groups as well, and um, it's very much typical politics play, um, you know, I, I want to make it clear, I'm not a fan of Holy Vada either. <laughs> I'm kind of, but I do feel he's he's kind of the lesser of the evils, mainly because Dominguez has been demonstrating a different type of leadership than Holy Vada, but uh, Rene does have fewer years left, and he has stated, whether this is going to play out or not, he has stated that, you know, he's only going to serve one or, one or two more terms. Um, he has spent 30-some years in office, uh, 30 was 36 years in office. So, um, no matter what he says, he does have a more limited time to play. And Dominguez, who, who I feel is kind of the same as Oliveira or even worse, um, in terms of, of, of time left and, and, and from what I've seen from Dominguez, um, Rene is kind of the less, he, he, no matter what, he has less time. And, um, Despite his, you know, I'm not a fan of him, and I do, and I think personally, on a personal note, 
I kind of resent Dominguez that much more because he's making me vote for Renee, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. and and I think I, 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 that plays a role too. Um, but yeah, I, I think the only reason I'm voting for Renee is is that he has less time left, and Dominguez is kind of almost almost exact. So he'll, he'll play in to the oil and gas interest. So he'll give them tax money and tax breaks and and all of that same kind of stuff. Um, and I just think. Um, I really feel that we need to bide our time and, and try to front somebody much different than the type of leadership we've had in the past 36 years. So it's just really kind of a strategy to find somebody else. And I think if Dominguez gets in office, it'll be kind of the same thing as Rene. It'll be hard to unseat him. Yeah, for, uh, for me, uh, I, I see both of them as pro-LNG. I, I even see Rene's uh, political advertisement saying, that he's conditioned, he conditioned his support for LNG, depending on the permits, if they're safe uh, uh, for public health as well as the environment. And then I see both of, both of them, they're just waiting for the permit, which gives them the, the okay. And if anything comes up, like environmental or safety concerns, they will refer to the state or federal agencies when incidents still out. I always feel like that's like the normal play. And uh, you, you're going with uh, what I need to, and for me, I kind of see that he's already done his part and he's been there for so long. And I just feel like he's just doing this to win. And once he wins, he's just going to ignore it and refer everything to the state agencies or the local jurisdictions that take care mm-hmm. of the complaints. So I feel like they're yeah. just they're just playing this little uh, trick. Um, I, I, for one, I think that regardless if it's the incumbent or not right now, it's the opportunity uh, to kind of take out the incumbent. And then you put a new junior person in there, and then you could have institutional contests uh, two years later, four years later with Alex, and maybe even lobby him, pressure him to become more environmental, also thinking about the jobs. But I feel like uh, Rene is just going to, I don't know, steamroll through the whole process. That's my yeah. take, but I, I don't know. I could be no, wrong. And I, yeah, I definitely see that, and, and it's a tough call. And you bring to light a very interesting point that, you know, what, you know, in terms of Renee, he's been there so long, what else does he, he says he has, you know, some last remaining or remaining things that he wants to accomplish, and he feels that he has time left. And that remains, like, well, what is that? Um, and I, I do think it's, um, yeah, that that is a big question, and I definitely see that point. And, you know, there is definitely a part of me that's poor, and, and, I, and I do see that point. That's a very good point. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think also it's significant that, that Renee is, 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 is talking about LNG that, that, you know, these tax advantages aren't, you know, that they weren't appropriate and, and talking somewhat negatively on the LNG. So I think that's someone's, that's somewhat significant, but, uh, that was surprising. No, I think it's also what that was surprising. Uh, I, saw, I, I agree yeah. with you. That was very yeah. surprising. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, I, I, I am, I am torn, um, and I'm just, and, and it's unfortunate, uh, really that, that these two candidates are the candidates that we have, and neither of them have really represented the public, um, and the citizen all too well. And, and I think, uh, this, the bigger picture of that is, is, is pretty unfortunate. Given given the stakes and the impacts that that are being uh, that are thrown at the public uh, in terms of tax dollars, in terms of infrastructure across the state that's going to be coming in, in terms of the increase in fracking, all this has public health concerns, direct public consequences uh, on health, uh, and we're seeing um, um, more health impacts in the Permian Basin. The health impacts have have been witnessed for a long time now in the Eagle Ford Shale by an industry. That is flat out denies it, and and like the Texas Commission of Environmental Quality, the the the, 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 the I forget his name, but you know he he's coming out and saying two years ago that oh well these health effects you know they're they're the oil and gas it's, it's, it's not that it's it's the paint in their houses, you know, and when we have people at 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 the TCQ saying that these health effects are because of bang factors inside their house rather than a fracking well right outside their home is is pretty scary. Um, and, um, 
So I think we definitely need leaders representing the public, and Dominguez and Rene certainly aren't those. Okay, so what's uh, moving on from that topic? What's your future plans? Are you going to be running again, or what's uh, the next movement that you'll be doing? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. In terms of my future plans, uh, my plans right now is just to continue my efforts with with the, the Sierra Club and Save Our GV from LNG um, and getting the, the information out to the public on, on what what's happening and what these industries are are actually are um, and and communicating with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission on on um, concerns. So one of the things that we're we're communicating right now is the SpaceX. Um, we're not totally sure that FERC is looking at the new plans for SpaceX to be launching bigger rockets. The, the, the analysis has, has been done by a third-party agency, um, but now these new plans for SpaceX, and we're not seeing signs that there's going to be any new analysis regarding that. Uh, so things like that, just, just you know, continuing to send in comments and, 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 and work with FERC um, on these projects um, and get the information out there to the public. Um, for two years down the road, will I run again? I've already run twice without much traction, so I think kind of the plan may be to, to uh, for the group, for the Save Our TV and the Sierra Club, to find somebody that can have more traction that will uh, represent the public a little bit more responsibly at the Port of Brownsville. Um, but we'll see, we'll, uh, you know, two years is, is a little bit of ways away, um, but we'll see what happens there. Um, but that's that's kind of where my thinking is right now. Okay. Well, on that note, Patrick Anderson, uh, I want to thank you for being an engaged citizen uh, that cares about this community, and I appreciate the time you've taken out of your schedule to talk to me about these issues. Uh, thank you for all your work. Yes, yes, thank you for having me. I all appreciate right. it. That was Los Fresnos teacher Patrick Anderson speaking with me about the Brownsville Navigation District elections, LNG, and the May 22nd, 2018 Democratic primary runoff election. Well, that does it for this month's show. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at the real underscore cheers. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the show so you can hear us every month. You can find us anywhere you uh, download podcasts. If you are subscribed, please do leave us a rating and a review. It helps others find us, and if you want to provide feedback, just email me at rpeverett at gmail.com. If you're not yet a patron, sign up and make a pledge. Until next time, I'm Patrick Everett.